Okay, here we are with two Model 3, Tesla Model 3 uh, full packs. And we've built a uh, controller for each of them and an Alcon charger for each of them. <coughs> They've been ordered by a gentleman farmer in Virginia who grows uh, organic produce, I believe, and has a big compound there that he wants to power uh, using two Tesla Model 3 batteries. And he's already ordered them and paid for them. We're preparing them for shipment. Um, we've done pretty well with the controller. Uh, these are the newer batteries that do not natively put out cell voltages. But as described in the last video, we can use the Universal Diagnostic Services Protocol over CAN UDS to request data from the uh, processor in the high voltage battery um, and it will give us each of the 96 cells their individual voltages. We've got over the air updates working so we can post updated software to Amazon and um, he can enter update equals one and it'll get the latest version and flash it into the firmware. We can control the Elcon charger <coughs> using our charge enable output. We actually control it using CAN, but it uses the cut off and resume voltages that we enter in the configuration page. And of course, uh, it displays on our battery display, just like the Model S modules uh, controller does. And so we're pretty confident at this point um, that this is working. It uh, closes the internal contactors so we can get power. Uh, we have our own contactors, a pre-charge resistor, to do a pre-charge sequence and connect the power of the battery to an inverter. Conceptually, this is the model I like using full EV voltages because the currents are so much lower. We can do a 20 kilowatt inverter at full power uh, at about 50 amps uh, at 400 volts, uh, 350, 400 volts. Uh, to do that uh, at 48 volts using the modules is over 400 amperes. And the I squared R losses in the cables uh, is unmanageable at those power levels. That's why we really can't go above about 15 kilowatts with the Signier inverters, which I do like. Um, unfortunately, I've never found a uh, high voltage inverter that I really liked. We've used the Sandys uh, from China. Uh, we've had problems with them. Uh, we've had problems shipping them. Sandy's not very good at the packaging. They're very heavy, six or 800 pounds. They weigh, uh, they cost, um, you know, uh, 12, 15, $20,000, depending on the power output you want. There's now a 25% tariff on them. And I'm just not comfortable selling them. The last one I had anything to do with was Stan Cloyd, and I basically connected him to them, and they shipped one to him directly. Um, and this guy, I just told him, I, I'm not going to sell you one of those. Here's the email address of Sandy. And he went ahead and bought a 50-kilowatt unit from them. Um, they will do the frequency shift. Sandy will build that in for me rather easily. Um, and so that's uh, not an issue. And that allows us to shift the frequency from 60 hertz to 62 and a half hertz for 500 milliseconds. And so we can shut down an in phase or a solar edge or any other UL 1741 compliant 
grid interactive inverter or micro inverter. And we need to be able to do that if the batteries get full. Um, and so all that's going pretty well, um, I think. Uh, but uh, I, I really don't want to be in the middle of a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar transaction that may arrive damaged in shipment, uh, and then what do you do with it? There's no, it's too big and heavy. The shipping's too much to send it back to China for repair, and their ability to support it from there is somewhat limited. And so we're still on a quest for a high voltage, um, twenty or thirty kilowatt. Uh, inverter. Uh, one viewer sent me to a company uh, where he uh, said they had one. Um, they actually don't exist anymore. They were bought out by Generac and Generac is now advertising uh, what they call a power cell which is different from a power wall in that it's from Generac. <laughs> And it uses high voltage batteries um, and apparently the inverter from this company. Um, and they are moving into the space um, previously occupied mostly by us and in theory by Tesla, although you couldn't actually buy one from Tesla in most cases, most locations. And so... Um, that's uh, interesting. Generac is probably exactly the company to be in that business. I think it's a very good move for them. I have not used their product. No, can't attest to it at all. But um, we like their switches. And I actually have a Generac generator at home uh, that runs on natural gas. Um, and so it's... Since they kind of own home generators, it is uh, not untoward for them to be uh, in the space of solar energy storage devices. It's actually probably a pretty good uh, marriage there. So that's uh, kind of interesting, but I have not played with their uh, devices at this point, and they're not technically available. They're kind of advertising them, but they'll be here soon, um, as in many things. Um, and so we're still on a quest for the high voltage um, inverter. And it's just, they're unavailable in the price range and the availability that we have with a Sigonier 48 volt. But I can assure you the way to do this long term is with full EV battery packs at full voltage and uh, reasonable uh, currents to produce even household or small facility, um, commercial facility uh, power. And so I know that's the right concept. We don't really have an inverter um, that can do that. Um, we get by with the Sandy. We've sold some uh, in the 5 and 10 kilowatt range. We have a couple of 20 kilowatt um, of their explosion proof, which are simply too expensive and uh, too heavy uh, for most people. And, and we've had failures. Uh, our most recent one was the uh, current sensor went bad and is reading about three times the current. And so the problem is the inverter shuts down from overload now at about six kilowatts because it can't read the current correctly. And we've confirmed this by, there is a setting for the current sensor uh, ratio. And we can move that current around with that ratio, uh, but we can't really make it right. And so we're waiting on a part from Sandy in China while half of China is home um, hiding from the coronavirus um, and are unable to make power with our Model 3 battery 
uh, until we get the part. So there are some problems uh, in sourcing an appropriate inverter. Um, the gentleman from Virginia, we gave him their email address and told him good luck. And he's already ordered a 50 kilowatt <laughs> and it's on its way. Uh, but we're out of the middle of that. Uh, we are gonna sell him the Model 3 battery packs. And they will work as Model 3 battery packs um, to provide the DC level uh, voltage and current he is uh, interested in working with. So that's the uh, latest update with the Model 3 batteries. Uh, we're pretty much at the point of uh, finishing crating these up and uh, shipping them to him. Uh, I still have a little question about the controller on this one we have to work off, but it's pretty minor. So uh, that's where we're at on the Model 3 battery. So on the topic of stock trading, uh, I've kind of stumbled into a second career as stock advisor to the Tesloids, and I'm getting about eight or 10 email messages a day now directly um, from people who uh, did pretty well on some of my prior um, videos on this topic, wanting to know, surely this is the bottom, and is it time to buy? And uh, I've uh, kind of replied fairly consistently, no, this isn't the bottom, and it's not time to buy. Today um, is the 12th of uh, March, and it's not a good day on the stock market or in any other way. And so I thought I'd do a little update and a confession that my resolve has weakened somewhat. Uh, this all starts January the 4th when I did a video called uh, Why I'm Shorting Tesla Stock Now. Uh, would you believe that I've gotten a... Uh, uh, hundreds, really, of comments on that video uh, telling me that if I was shorting Tesla stock, I was an idiot. Um, apparently, they would know because, of course, the video, it was kind of a clickbait title, or at least tongue-in-cheek. Uh, I didn't short Tesla stock at all. In fact, I described a kind of a um, advanced uh, option straddle on Tesla's stock that wound up making me over $2 million. Um, but the number of people who saw the title and came in and commented without watching the video um, was astonishing. The uh, sort of average IQ of uh, people on YouTube now, viewing videos is very discouraging for me. I've seriously considered just not posting there anymore. Um, they, it's low enough now that they could have their own special Olympics on YouTube for these people. Uh, it, it's uh, discouraging. In any event, what I did describe was how I had about 1,100 shares of Tesla, I sold 800 of them, moved that to cash, and used some of the cash to um, buy call and put options way out of the money for, you know, a buck or two bucks. As you know now, uh, that was when Tesla was trading at $505 a share, I think. Um, it thereafter climbed to a peak of $969, and I cleared over $2 million, very conservatively selling off those call options um, and just letting the uh, put options, forget it, forget about them. I've since made some on the put options going on in the other direction, but um, did very, very well with it. And uh, had 
was in the process of buying back in to whole shares because of the increased volatility of Tesla. The pricing on the options had gotten to be ridiculous. And so I was moving back into whole shares and gradually accumulating them until February 24th of 2020, at which point I made my second, a brilliant call in the stock market. As I say, um, it's better to be lucky than good, and uh, timing is everything. But the market had been a little choppy the week before, and on Monday, February 24th, I uh, looked at it, it fell kind of uh, broadly on the futures, maybe two or 300 points. And then it tried to stage a comeback at the open and that failed and collapsed. And at 8.40 in the morning, 20 minutes into the market, I just said, that's it, I'm out of here. And I moved 100% into cash. I kept one share of Amazon, one share of uh, um, Apple, one share of Tesla, uh, one share of Uber, and one share of Enphase, just so I would have a little portfolio there that I could see what the stocks were doing in the coming days. But went 100% into cash. Today is April the 12th. Uh, the market is... Uh, this afternoon was down 2,086 points today at 21,467.46 on the Dow Jones Industrials, and that is 6,685 points lower and about 20% um, crash in the stock market uh, in the last uh, three weeks. Um, which is 20% below the high and, and moves it into bear territory. Uh, and I've been sitting there uh, almost entirely in cash until the last couple of days. And of those that uh, similarly panicked, as I did on February 24th, were feeling pretty smug these days. And the question that keeps coming up is, Jack, when, when are you going back in? Um, and they want this to be a very short-term thing. Uh, if I can't predict the future, uh, even though I just have very well twice uh, in the last couple of months. Um, but here's what I think will happen. I think the market will uh, continue to go down. It'll find a bottom, and it'll bounce back. That's the dead cat bounce I'm talking about. And it'll recover 10 or 12% of what it lost. Uh, it'll go back up uh, about half to where it had been, and then it'll fall again. And the second fall will be kind of gradual. It will be several months of uh, just stair-stepping down. And so the, the real bottom, uh, July or August or even later. And I've been telling people to wait at least until the number of coronavirus stories falls to some low level like a hundred an hour or something uh, and that people get over this coronavirus panic. Uh, yesterday and today, I have weakened in my resolve and so I don't advise you to do this. It's exactly as I've described, but at some price, I just look at this and I can't stay out. And so I'm dabbling, sticking a toe back in the market, and I'll show you what I've got going here. I still have one share of Apple, but I've picked up 200 uh, options for Apple at $350, 
by September 18th. Um, and I averaged about $6.32 on those. They're currently trading at $5.04. So I'm uh, being handed my head. I've lost 19% on that. Uh, so far, it, it, it ain't over till it's over. And 100 contracts at $2.11 uh, that are currently trading at $1.55. Uh, those are down 23%, and that's on a September 18th $400 call on Apple. I've done the same thing on Amazon. Uh, a June th uh, $3,000 way out of the money call at two dollars and twenty two cents that's down to sixty two percent and I've lost seventy two percent on that and uh, another hundred contracts again for three thousand but uh, on September I paid four dollars and twenty three cents and they're trading at two twenty so I'm only down thirty eight thirty nine percent on that um, today well, yesterday, the day before yesterday, I bought 300 shares of Tesla at $705. And today I bought another 200 at uh, 550. And uh, let's see where we're at here. Right at the moment. Um, The very latest Tesla is 563. So I'm up $13 on 200 shares uh, today. Um, other than that, I haven't made any real changes. <coughs> I still have $1,788,000 cash in that account. And so I'm not buying in with both feet but I simply could not help myself. Um, Apple and Amazon and Tesla at these levels, uh, I, I just, I, I couldn't help myself. I had to buy a little bit. But it'll be a long time before those come back uh, because I don't think it's over. Um, the coronavirus panic has just gotten to be crazy. Um, President Trump was on TV last night with some perfectly reasonable, perfectly sane, perfectly calm uh, steps on the coronavirus. And um, the godless heathen Democrats who have no hope of an afterlife, so they're truly terrified of all this, just went crazy. Um, they're... Uh, uh, criticisms of him are deranged and uh, so he came back on today and I wish he'd quit coming on television because it's just panicking uh, the rest of the country uh, or at least the people on TV I don't really see people around me too panicked but on television they're wild-eyed uh, their voices are trembling they're they're in deep deep fear of the coronavirus, um, which is inexplicable. I should be in deep, deep fear. I've got COPD, smoked camels for 51 years, I'm 64 years old, I've already had a heart attack. If I get in the same state with coronavirus, I'm a dead man, <clears throat> the way they describe it. And the stock market is going crazy. Jim Cramer this morning was absolutely in tears and screeching that the federal government should start mailing checks to every corporation in the country. Uh, it, it, it was surreal. Surreal what people are, they're just lined up to get a little FaceTime on TV to say that they're more panicked than the last person that was on. And their reasoning, there is no reasoning. Um, it, it's completely uh, crazy talk. Um, but everyone, and everyone on YouTube is fighting to uh, get uh, 
uh, views uh, so that people will realize how really awful coronavirus is and how panicked they are about it. And now you should be panicked too. <laughs> China claims to be leveling off and only reporting a few dozen cases a day now after having 80,000 cases in a country with 1.4 billion people um, we're claiming about 1,200 cases today um, and again uh, I sincerely believe we don't know um, and this is going to sound like I think it's worse than you think uh, it's not but uh, we have not been able to get tested. Um, I believe that they made the right move in getting test kits out to people, and they did it so quickly uh, that the tests weren't any good. Um, the test kits they originally sent out had two problems. One, they exhibited an extremely high number of false uh, negatives. And the other was that they also ex exhibited an extremely high uh, percentage of false positives. Well, that means it's not a test at all. <laughs> and so uh, three weeks later, they had to restart the entire process. And Pence has uh, uh, claimed that they're um, sending out millions of test kits now. But in most places, you can't get tested. What? Well, we don't have a reported case of coronavirus until you test positive. And if you can't get tested at all, how do you test positive? So we don't know how many people have the coronavirus. But we do know how many are panicked. And that appears to be everybody. It sounds like and feels like that I may have the coronavirus, but I haven't been tested, and so I don't know. Meanwhile, they've canceled the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, over 100 universities have uh, closed the doors and are discontinuing classes on campus. Most of them have gone to some sort of really lame online class type situation. Harvard led the charge. They actually ordered everybody off campus. You have to get out of your dorm or your housing on campus. Um, MIT and Stanford immediately followed, and now over 100 campuses have closed the doors. The NBA has suspended their basketball season. Um, I'm starting to wonder if maybe we'll lose the baseball season as well, which is my fondest hope, as whenever we're in baseball season, my television watching is interrupted uh, by my wife, who has to see every game on TV, and they only run about four hours when they play, Cardinals play one. Um... Worst of all, Tom Hanks has gotten the coronavirus in Australia. And he reports chills and fever and sniffles. And he and his wife have both tested positive. They're both 63 years old. Um, he has type 2 diabetes. They're destined to uh, cough and sneeze. Uh, for another couple of days, <laughs> and that's that's about the size of it. Um, almost everything you do here reported is dubious on the face of it. I just watched a medical doctor describe how coronavirus can live up to three hours in the air and up to three days on stainless steel or plastic. Now I ask you, how does he know that? Have they had time to do a test and publish uh, using viruses that fell on plastic or stainless steel and then infected somebody with it? 
I don't think so. They're making up stuff from what they kind of, sort of, know about other viruses. Uh, and what I've always heard about the influence of virus and so forth is about 45 minutes outside the body, maybe an hour. It's slightly variable and kind of hard to pin down because it's hard to test. Um, and I'm more familiar with the problems with the testing than I am with the results because the results are dubious uh, at that. Uh, in theory, it can't live outside the body at all. And the whole discussion about is, on the edge case, uh, can they sometimes exist for a little while outside the body? But it's a very difficult thing to set up and, and test definitively. Um, they are also insisting that only the elderly are um, affected by this, and in fact, children are immune. I don't think so. Um, a doctor in Los Angeles is uh, essentially treating an entire ski team that got back from Europe uh, with um, eight of the 13 of them having, not testing positive, but having the virus. And uh, they got an 80-year-old uh, dancing around leading the pack in perfect health and uh, three people in their 40s in intensive care. And so this uh, concept that it's uh, only uh, for the elderly does not appear to have any basis in fact at all. Uh, the, the reason we're kind of inclined to that was uh, it broke out in a nursing home in Washington, and that's where almost all of the deaths in the U.S. have come from. These were older people. They did have health problems, and they did. Uh, apparently, everybody in the nursing home, near enough, got it, and um, that's where most of the deaths have come from. That says nothing about school children or middle-aged people in good health uh, and, and what would happen to them. And so this is all essentially nonsense. Coronavirus is not like the flu, it is a flu. Uh, the influenza is a coronavirus. Uh, the, the coronavirus is not the name of this disease. It's a description of a vi virus that has some projections on the surface of it that make it look like a crown. And so it's a physical description of a uh, uh, genus of virus, um, and and so there there doesn't appear to be any uh, broad distinction between uh, coronavirus and influenza. Um, it is a type of influenza, but it's a different strain, and we have different strains. We had H one N and SARS and. Uh, uh, avian uh, flu and any number of them. Uh, and they are different mutations of uh, influenza. And this one, it is feared, has a much higher mortality rate. By much higher, uh, we're talking about instead of 0.1%, um, somewhere to to even as high as 5%. And that, again, is difficult to measure. They keep uh, comparing the death rates, which are pretty well defined, to the uh, uh, infection rate, which, as I said, we don't even know what it really is because of limitations on testing. Um, Korea has been the most aggressive on testing and they have a quite low incidence of death compared to the number of people that have caught the virus. Catching the virus is the beginning uh, of the process that leads to one or two events. You either recover or you die. And the mortality rate properly is a comparison of the number recovered to the number who died. Uh, not 
a comparison of the number that you think are infected today, most of which don't have an outcome yet. We don't know what the mortality rate is until they either recover or die. And so even the process of discussing mortality rates uh, to me is nonsensical as I have heard it described on television. Trump has shut down all travel from Europe and um, had earlier and quite early um, shut off travel from China. The number of people infected is kind of a function of the virus finding a vector. As I said, they only live inside cells, not just inside people, but they have to get inside a cell pretty quick or they die. They're barely alive. A virus is only considered living because it fulfills one function of uh, what we consider to be alive, and that is the ability to reproduce. It doesn't eat. It doesn't uh, uh, do anything, really, uh, except propagate. And it actually does not have the ability to reproduce at all. It invades human cells and makes the cell reproduce it for it. And under, unlike uh, other life forms uh, that have... Uh, deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA, uh, a virus has a much simpler genetic string, um, ribonucleic acid, RNA, and it can trick a cell into making copies of itself, but they're very bad copies. And so when it invades a cell, it might get that one cell to make 100,000 uh, viruses. Ninety-nine percent of them do not even retain the ability to invade a cell. They're not viable at all. And uh, of the ones remaining, uh, some of them can uh, get around, say you could say they're viable, uh, but they don't pose a threat to anybody. And so a handful of them a relative handful of them, are sufficiently close copies that they can continue the spread uh, by invading other cells. Uh, once in a while, it can throw a mutation that's more deadly uh, than the uh, uh, normal strain, and that can uh, be quite interesting. That's essentially the mutation of the Spanish flu in 1917-18. At that time, we had no process for isolating um, people with influenza. In fact, we were packing them on boats and sending them to Europe and forming them up into training camps here in the United States and, uh, at, and every act hastening the uh, spread of the virus. And uh, it did not come and go in a month or two. It built over the course of two years uh, to the point where World War I, the dirty little secret, it ended because neither side could field an army. In fact, neither side could even communicate with their armies as everybody was uh, laid out with the virus. Uh, most of whom survived, but again, a very high mortality rate. And in rears, it's been estimated that as many as 100 million people worldwide died of that influenza. Um, the concept here in uh, shutting off uh, travel with China and with Europe is to flatten the curve. And so that will actually prolong the uh, period of infection, but reduce the peak. And what we're trying to do there is to not overwhelm 
our health care system where nobody can possibly get a bed. And that happened here in the U.S. in 1917. Uh, uh, there were some cities where you couldn't get any medical attention. You were on your own. Um, it, it, they had completely filled the available medical facilities, but worse, most of the doctors and nurses had already gotten the influenza and had died. And so, in spite of all that, it eventually ran its course because as the population of people who have recovered expands, this is kind of an insulation to uh, keep the uh, virus from uh, replicating and spreading. It has to go from host to host. Once the body's immune system has produced the um, T-cell lymphocytes, which don't really attack the virus, they actually attack the host cell and completely destroy it and excrete it, uh, along with the broken, by then killed, viruses. Um, once you have those, uh, they don't stop until the virus is pretty much gone out of your body. But any additional invaders are immediately killed because you already have those uh, T lymphocytes um, on board. If you have the virus and are infectious, but everybody around you that you come in contact with has already recovered, the virus has no place to go. And you can either die or you can recover, but either way, if it didn't find a new host, that's the end of the strain. It simply dies out. And so the concept <coughs> is to uh, isolate uh, populations until the virus dies out of uh, inability to find a host. You can't ever really isolate well enough, but as the number of recovered people expands, uh, the virus kind of dies out of its own accord. And so it appears to go away after a while. Um, we didn't really cure anything and we didn't uh, do any of that. Today, it's 100 years later, we have a lot more at our disposal. Um, the first thing, and, and the Trump administration has addressed this, they haven't really succeeded with it, but they've addressed it, and that is we need to get a lot of uh, testing kits out there to be able to map where this is happening and do what we can to try to isolate it. Uh, item number two is to work on a vaccine. Everyone talks like this is hopeless. It's not hopeless. The last 10 years, we have been a very successful in developing new um, tools uh, for gene splicing and DNA engineering. And it's, it's so good, we already have several vaccines for the coronavirus. Fortunately, these are lab-type tools. They don't produce vaccines in any quantity. Then, too, they have to be tested. The problem with the vaccine is you're actually injecting pieces of the virus into the host. And uh, it has to be significant enough that you do produce the correct T lymphocytes in your immune system, which takes a couple weeks. Um, but if it's uh, uh, too uh, uh, good of pieces or contains live viruses, it can actually give you the disease. One of these vaccines is in phase one trials right now. Phase one trials are not to find out if it's effective. Phase one trials in the United States means you have to prove that you don't kill people with the vaccine. 
is it safe if I give it to 100 people, how many of them get sick and die? And zero being the desired number, by the way. Doesn't mean it's effective, it just means first do no harm. It doesn't kill anybody. <laughs> and then it goes into other trials. Meanwhile, to go from the lab to production is kind of like making an electric car or making a million of them. And uh, the same tools used to uh, uh, examine the virus RNA string and create a uh, vaccine aren't useless for making any quantity. So they have to develop a process to produce large volumes of it, and then it has to be distributed. Um, right now, we can't get the test kits out there quick enough. So you see the problem. And you have to be able to produce millions of uh, doses of this vaccine where you go, where you have people with coronavirus, and basically vaccinate all of them. And you can kill off a disease with this. We've um, pretty much done it with smallpox and polio. When I was six years old, we all trotted down to the school for a sugar cube and got the soft polio vaccine. Uh, this was a much worse disease than um, coronavirus, and we suffered from it for um, decades or hundreds of years uh, without a whole lot of complaint. But it was sure a big deal when all of a sudden uh, polio wasn't a big deal um, because we simply uh, blanketed the country with vaccination and the polio virus uh, had no place to go. It had no vector. And so it literally dies off. It's not like it can go into hiding. It has to continuously find new cells to replicate it, or it dies. It becomes non-viable. It cannot retain that capacity very long, uh, measured in hours, um, without ha invading a cell and replicating in it. So, Rather than depending on the natural recovery of people uh, to eventually limit the spread of the virus and kill it off, with vaccination, we can artificially surround it with people that have already recovered without ever having the disease, but have the um, immune response necessary to eliminate the vector for the virus. And that's, that's uh, called crushing it. And um, so that's the second leg of the process. The third one is uh, to produce uh, antivirals or things that limit the activity of the virus. We're not very good at that. Um, you can sometimes improve outcomes of virus-borne diseases with antivirals, uh, but it's... Uh, uh, kind of like kissing your sister. You kind of got to do it, but not much is going to come out, out of it. It's, uh, it's just not uh, extremely effective. And they're working on all of that. The isolation portion, the social distancing and so forth, is to keep the growth of the disease from overwhelming our health care system where the people that do get it can get a hospital bed if they need it. And uh, so what they're talking about there is not going and hanging out with crowds of people and exchanging microbes with them. And that means schools and basketball games. Uh, why does it uh, dampen in the summer? I, I've heard ridiculous things about temperature and humidity and so forth. This is a raving of idiots. Um, the virus doesn't care about the humidity, and it certainly doesn't care about the temperature of summer. The, your body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Why would being outdoors in the summer have any effect? 
And in fact, one of your body's defenses is to raise the temperature, and that works very poorly uh, with viruses. And so there's nothing about the seas in the virus uh, notes, but you go to a lot fewer indoor basketball games in the summer, uh, more likely outdoor tennis or baseball or something like that. Um, and you tend to involve in summer activities that are naturally more socially distancing. So this is effective. Stay home. And what are you going to do at home? Well, I'm going to use my Apple computer and my Apple iPhone uh, to communicate with the world. And I'm going to order stuff from Amazon. And that's why that's two of the stocks I'm investing in uh, this morning with call options for September primarily. Um, but I expect both of them to do rather well. Uh, Apple's mostly hampered by Chinese supplier issues that uh, we're having here. Uh, and I expect that they will get better. Uh, in just the next few weeks. Um, Amazon is a way to order stuff, even food, have it delivered to your house and not have to go out to the grocery store or whatever. In Italy, they have shut down every kind of shop, which they mostly did in China, except for grocery stores and pharmacies. No bars are open, no movie houses, no restaurants. None of that. And again, it's an attempt at social uh, distancing that uh, is fairly effective at limiting the spread of the virus. So one of their big ideas is that you stay at home. Well, that's mostly what I do anyway. I'm kind of xenophobic, and I don't really like big crowds of people anyway. And so I don't go out much, uh, less so all the time. But it's not because of the germs. It's just, I like staying home, watching TV, playing on a computer, and cooking uh, pot-type dishes. I'm old. It's okay that I do that. So, um, uh, but I expect that to be a big trend over the next few months. The oil industry, the airline carriers, the cruise ships, uh, Carnival has... Uh, basically docked 18 brand new ships and they won't be going to sea for two or three months. Um, I'm not big on cruises. Um, when I cruise, I like to take an aircraft carrier. But uh, I don't do much of that anymore. <coughs> and uh, my wife returns today from a cruise of the Amazon River on a Viking cruise ship, which turns out she wasn't roughing it too much. Uh, the average age of the people on the ship was 80, and I've been terrified, not that she'll get coronavirus, but she'll be get caught up in all this crazed stupidity, and they won't let her dock or come back into the country. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's been roughing it on the Amazon, mostly going down the river, looking out the window at the Amazon, and playing bridge and drinking Chardonnay with a bunch of 80-year-old blue-haired gals. Wow, roughing it. Anyway, I'll be glad to get her safely home because I don't want her out among all these crazy, panicked people who might hurt her with their panic. I don't... Care, you care if she gets the coronavirus, she can bring me home some. I don't mind. Uh, for most of you, and I mean 80 or 90 percent, that get the coronavirus, you're going to have a runny nose. You're going to have a fever. You're going to feel like crap for a couple, three days. That's it. That's the whole deal. Um... We have had 34 million cases of influenza since October. About 25,000 people have died of it. 
that happens every year. And one of the good things of all this social di distancing is we've got a good shot at wiping out this strain, at least, of influenza <laughs> at the same time and for some of the same reasons. So I'm uh, underwhelmed by the coronavirus, but truly impressed, astonished, and alarmed by the degree of panic in the United States over the coronavirus. I'm extremely pleased to report that the Japanese did not attack uh, Pearl Harbor this week because this generation of Americans couldn't take it. We couldn't cut it. You, you guys don't have the guts. You're too cowardly, too entitled, and too pathetic to go through any of the stuff that prior generations have gone through. This coronavirus is small potatoes uh, compared to many of the things that we've been through as a nation. And um, I would say, uh, suck it up, babe. We're going to get through it just fine. And it, it, the only thing that's going to make it inconvenient is all the panic from the people around us, not from the virus. So uh, relax, take a powder, do something. Aside from social distancing, um, hand washing, every time I hear that, I just get a chill. You mean you don't wash your hands now? Or you want to wash them till they're raw? Wh what? Um, here's something you might think about doing, though. I was over at Walmart, and they've got a flu um, vaccinations right there in the store. You don't even need a medical appointment. Um, a flu vaccination isn't going to help you at all with the coronavirus. But they also give pneumonia vaccinations. Pneumococcus is a type of bacteria. It's on your body right now, I guarantee it. You carry it around all the time. The number one killer in the cases of influenza is never influenza. It wasn't in 1918, and it wasn't in 2019, 2020. But as an upper respiratory disease, it tends to strip out the epithelial cells in your lungs and trachea and so forth, and along with it, some uh, cilia, uh, small hair-like structures that move debris out of your lungs and cause you to cough up a lung oyster and get it out of your body. Those are stripped away. And without them, you are instantly exposed to the very real possibility of a secondary bacterial infection. And the one that's most handy and most universal is pneumococcus, and so we call that pneumonia. And almost everyone who is listed as having died from influenza never died of influenza at all. They died of pneumonia, a secondary bacterial infection. And so uh, we actually have a vaccine for that now. You can be vaccinated against pneumonia and pneumococcus bacteria. And that's sufficiently available and common that you walk into a Walmart, I don't know what it is, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, Richard, and, and get a shot without ever seeing a doctor. The pharmacy does it. And you're protected from the uh, pneumococcus bacteria. Um, and that is... Uh, I think would virtually terminate the fatality from the coronavirus. I don't think the coronavirus can actually kill you. But if you uh, have it, you're almost guaranteed to get a secondary pneumococcus infection uh, on top of it. And that is uh, um, the thing. 
this is why they will assure you that antibiotics can do nothing for the coronavirus, and yet when people get sick, they give them antibiotics and they seem to get well. They're not getting well from the virus. They're getting well from the pneumonia that almost always accompanies it. So uh, for 20 or 30 bucks, while you're in the Walmart anyway, uh, why not get a uh, pneumonia vaccination uh, to prevent that? And so that would be my recommendation. If you don't already wash your hands, you're not doing enough work. <laughs> you need to get your hands dirty and wash them a lot. Um, you might get a job <laughs> getting your hands dirty and, uh, and then maybe you'll wash them more. Um, you can uh, certainly remove viruses from your hands. They can't survive very long there anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, wash them off. But if I hear one more 24-year-old titty blonde on TV telling me to wash my hands, I am going to get sick. It may not be the coronavirus, but it could be as bad. I can feel the vomit rising in the back of my throat. With her all wild-eyed wild and scared to death telling me to wash my hands. Uh, so anyway, um, that's... Uh, uh, what I would have to say as a practical matter in dealing with coronavirus and understanding how it uh, progresses through a population. Um, but it's certainly affecting the stock market. Everybody's in a panic, and I can't believe how far and how fast it has fallen. It's not over. Keep your powder dry. As you can see, even though I can't resist it and I have to buy in a little bit, 90% of my holding in this account is entirely in cash and will be for some time. But Apple, Amazon, Tesla at these levels, I can't help myself. <laughs> I have to have a little. Uh, they're just too big of bargains. Uh, but realistically, I expect them to go down further before they come back up and, um, and make me look like a genius one more time. Could be wrong. Maybe today was the bottom. I kind of doubt it. Anyway, that's my stock market advice for um, f uh, March 12th, 2020. And uh, uh, that's where we're at. We'll see how I do with that. Stay with us.